I'm going to talk about devils, disciples, and doctrines. Devils, disciples, and doctrines. Now, first of all, in this end of the age, we are in a uh, position uh, much worse, I would say, than the early Christian church. Even as a Christian church and millions upon millions of people professing the Lord Jesus Christ, we are divided into many, many different groups. In the uh, Protestant groups, they call them denominations. And then, of course, we also have, I imagine, thousands of churches in the United States that call themselves non-denominational, implying that, well, they don't have anything to do with the other denominations. Some call themselves Bible churches, some Christian churches. We have Christian science. We have Jehovah's Witnesses who claim to be separate from the uh, general run of Protestant churches. And, of course, the Catholic Church. And we find that even inside the Catholic Church there is much division as to just what is right and what is wrong. The result, of course, is that a good share of our people, both churchgoers and non-churchgoers, especially the young people, especially the teenagers and the children growing up, are very confused as to just what Christianity is. The young people, even if they attend a church and they go to college or university and they get in a conversation with a friend and the friend will say, well, what do you teach? Generally speaking, they don't ask, what does the Bible teach? They say, what does your religion teach? What does your denomination teach? What does your church teach? With the result that in most instances, the children, if they know anything at all, they know only what their group teaches and they do not know for sure what the Bible teaches. Because of this great division which Paul preached against, setting up all of this religion and denominations, everyone at some variance with another. And, uh, of course, they talk about salvation and they talk about ways and so on, and explaining the what they call the Christian religion or Christianity. Now, some of these churches teach, in effect, that Christianity is a way of life. Most people agree that that has something to do with it, but in this process they end up with as many ways of life as there are <coughs> denominations. Some of them say you can eat pork and some say you can't. Some say the law is done away with, some say it isn't, with the result that you still have confusion, especially for the young people. Now, there is another general definition of Christianity that is used, I believe, by practically all of the denominations. And that's the idea that you're a Christian if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to read a few verses in the New Testament to show you that this isn't quite adequate for this reason. Over in James 2.19, James is writing to Christian people and he says to them, Verse 19 of chapter 2 of James, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So if we're talking about just strict belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, James says the devils believe in one God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and tremble. He says you do good if you believe, but devils believe. So we could hardly use that as the only definition of Christianity because we'd have to include all the devils along with the rest of us in this so-called religion of Christianity. Turn over to Luke 4. In, uh, some say, well, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, uh, be sure that you know Him by name, that you believe on Him. Some use the term in Him and some on Him. But in Luke 4, starting in verse 33... I read the following. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. Now this is the devil crying out in this man, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do, thou Jesus of Nazareth? He not only knew Christ, but he knew him by name. Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. So the devil knows Jesus by name. He knows where he comes from, from Nazareth. And he knows that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. 
And when the devil had thrown him in the midst of him, he came out of him and hurt him not. Now, in other words, simple belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God or the Holy One of God is also known by the devil. They know there's one God and they also know the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Acts 19. And here is a rather strange situation. Some of you recall this. In Acts 19 and verse 13, it says that certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Now here are men who are going to go out and cast out devils using the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what happened. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was, was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So it appears that uh, it doesn't even work just to go out and call the name of the Lord Jesus Christ upon these things. The devil says, I know Jesus Christ and I know Paul. Who are you? Were they Christians? Well, they must not have been. Because even though they called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over a devil, the devil had power over them. They didn't have power over the devil. And yet we know the scripture says that God gives us power over devils through his name. But these men did not have it, even though they used it. So it appears that um, Christians are not all necessarily those who use the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for any purposes. Now turn with me over to Romans 1. It's also important that we understand that this uh, idea that uh, devils fear God or know God and tremble, and that Christians know God, also includes everybody else. Everybody else knows God. Everyone in the world knows that there is a God. Now, this is what Paul says in the first chapter of Romans, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They have the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, and the margin says to them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Now the things that are made is man. Man is a creation of God. And Paul is saying that man sees the evidence of God Almighty, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Brother, sister, Paul is implying in rather strange language that man, the creature of God Almighty, has had revealed to him the eternal power and Godhead, and he has no excuse whatsoever for not believing this word. Devils know, devils know Christ by name, even know where he came from, and he's the Holy One of God. Now, this idea that everybody who preaches in the name of Jesus Christ is therefore what we would call a Christian is pretty tenuous ground to stand on when we find that devils know him by name and devils can actually turn around and take power and hurt people who claim the name of Jesus Christ if they don't claim it in the correct way. Now, as far as Paul saying this in Romans 1, I've had a little experience with this. I've tried this a few times. I had a rather strange experience on an airplane one day. Um, I was, um, I think I was going back from Omaha to Minneapolis when the, remember when the uh, war broke out in 1967 between the Arabs and the Jews? And I had the opportunity uh, to talk about that for a few minutes. I had just purchased the paper that morning in Omaha. I think it was a Monday morning. I'd been down there preaching in the Omaha church. And, uh, man sat down beside me and we got some conversation. Here's the front page of the paper all about this war. So I started telling him that many people believed that the end of the age would be signaled by an invasion of Russia into Palestine. 
and that if uh, these communist forces supposedly behind the Arabs were to invade Palestine, that many of the fundamentalists believed that this signaled the end of the age. And the fellow got quite frightened. He was smoking and drinking. They serve drinks on these planes, you know. He was smoking and drinking, obviously not a Christian, but do you know he believed me when I said that God said the end of the age would be signified by a great battle to involve many nations, and the man was rather frightened. Then I went on a little further to explain that there were signs and other things that had to happen, and he was quite interested, and he talked, and I had my Bible. I was reading the Bible. He was smoking and drinking. I was reading the Bible, <laughs> and uh, I said there were many things that appeared that had to be completed yet that I believe that in this nation there would be a great turning to the Lord first before the end of the age, and that I really thought this was just a skirmish over there and not really the end of the age. And you know what he said? Well, I certainly hope so. That man believed in God, right? Was he a Christian? No, absolutely not. But he believed in God and he knew enough about the Bible, and Paul says that everybody knows. All of creation has seen the eternal power, and the Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That man was without excuse for not knowing what the Bible said about the end of the age. And I know from his reaction that he believed in the Lord, and he knew that there was a God, and he knew that there was an end of the age coming, and he knew some of these other things, but he didn't want anything to do with it. But he was very relieved when I said I didn't believe that this was the actual battle at the end of the age. All right, turn over with me to Acts 11. In Acts 11, we find the story of the men have been preaching for some time. They've been going throughout uh, the area of Judea and in Samaria, and they've been converting people by the time you get to Acts 11 by the thousands, thousands of people. And starting in verse 22, it says, speaking of Barnabas, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with the purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Now, when you use the term added unto the Lord, it obviously doesn't mean these other people, all of whom know the Lord and know there is a God. It means that there's something changed about them. They have been added unto. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now here is someone finally, and this is about the only verse in the entire Bible that gives you a definition of Christians. Now there are quite a few places in the scripture that we uh, have definitions that are in part where they use the term Christ's in the possessive term, ye are Christ, and so on. But here is a place where the word Christian is used, and look who is called Christian. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, I went to the trouble to look up in this dictionary again, and I have this out here so you'll see I'm not just reading some uh, small dictionary that someone wrote in order to sell a few copies for 75 cents apiece. This is supposedly one of the most authoritative dictionaries in the world, and uh, the definition of disciples in that dictionary reads this way. One who receives instruction from another, a learner, especially one who accepts the doctrines of his teacher and assists in spreading them. Let me read that again. It says that disciples were called Christian. We've already seen the devils aren't called Christian, right? We've already seen that there are everybody in the world, every one of the creation should really know that there is a God. And I believe that if you and I were to go out here and go from door to door in this neighborhood or any neighborhood in this city, that we would find perhaps 99% of the people would say yes if we would say, do you believe there is a supreme being that rules the universe? They would say yes. But here it says... The people called Christians were disciples. And that dictionary says a disciple is one who receives instruction from another, a learner, especially one who accepts the doctrines of his teacher 
and assists in spreading them. Now, there are three parts to that. You have to receive instruction. You have to accept the doctrines. In other words, believe them, accept them. And what would you do if you don't have number three? Assist in spreading them. Do you see what happens if we try and take this definition and place it upon all of these people who go to Christian churches all over the United States? Could we really call them disciples? They do not accept to a great extent the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ, even the ones that they accept in what little bit they do know. I wonder how much they do in number three, assist in spreading them. Now to use the disciples, and that's the term for these men who preach the gospel, how much of a disciple do you think Matthew and Mark and Luke and John would have been if they had listened to the Lord Jesus Christ teach, even if they had accepted his doctrines and then turned around and says, well, that's good news, but I'm going fishing tomorrow and I've got a job to do and I'm going back. And turned around and went back to their old job and never had anything more to do with Jesus Christ or the spreading of his doctrines. Do you think they'd be called disciples? And my Bible said it was the disciples who were called Christians. Now, if people have to fit the definition of disciple first to be called Christian, and I believe that that's scripturally correct, then it means that they not only have to receive instruction, they have to accept the doctrines of the teacher, and they have to help spread that doctrine. How do you suppose the kingdom of God would come if no one helped spread the doctrine? If they all just believed and said, well, that's nice, but I'm going back to work. Turn over to Matthew 5. And we've already seen, as I mentioned, that devils are not Christians. Now, I suppose I could go further and say that there may be a lot of people who are professing Christians who are really devils because they claim the name of Jesus Christ and they use it, but they won't have anything to do with Christ's doctrines. So let's read a few of the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's think with me as I go along here and see how much of this we, as a nation and as a people called Christian, accept these things. And I'm just going to uh, read a few verses here and there. You can follow me with me in your Bible if you can. Matthew 5 is uh, a few verses here on the, in the Sermon on the Mount. In uh, verse 3 it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 5 it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I wonder how many Christian people actually believe that the meek are going to inherit the earth. My radio that I listen to has a lot of preachers on it, and they tell me that all the Christians are going to heaven. And some of them tell you that if you preach that there's going to be anything on earth as a reward for Christians, it's your antichrist. And yet Christ said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Matthew 6, Christ taught us a prayer. Part of it goes this way. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We're supposed to pray to this God who is almighty, who created heaven and earth, and we're supposed to pray that his will shall be done in earth as it is in heaven. And Christ said, if we prayed in the Father's will in his name, he would do it. What does that mean? That means if we pray this prayer, that God Almighty's will will be done in earth, then it will be. Right? What's that? The gospel of the kingdom. And yet, I should imagine that 90% of the Christian preachers in this nation deny that God's will, complete will, will ever be done in the earth. Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable. This is uh, this great chapter with all these parables. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. And then Christ explained the parable to the disciples. And in verse 38 he said, The field is the world. The field is the world. Where was the good seed of the kingdom planted? Well, in the world. And yet they tell me all the good seed are not going to be in the world. They're all going to be in heaven. Okay, Matthew 21. 
I'm just picking these out at random. Uh, there are quite a few places in the Scripture where it says that Christ taught the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God and so on. In Matthew 21, speaking to the Pharisees, remember, the Pharisees would fit the description of those who believe in a God, and we think they're devils, and they would know Jesus Christ, right? And he said to them, verse 43, but they're not Christian, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruit thereof. The kingdom of God was going to be given to a nation. In Matthew 25, in these uh, words of Christ, as he described his own return, in verse 31 he says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king, Jesus Christ, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Nations will go into the kingdom according to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think this doctrine is accepted by very many so-called Christian denominations? And yet, according to the Webster's Dictionary in my Bible, a disciple has to be someone who accepts the doctrine of his teacher. Jesus Christ, being the teacher, has a doctrine that says that nations will be taken into the kingdom. Turn over to 1 Corinthians 6. I wonder if Paul knew this. Anything about what was going to happen in the world or on the earth. He's rebuking these Christian people because of some troubles that they had. And in the process of trying to straighten them up regarding their legal problems and lawsuits and fights among themselves... He says in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Brother, sister, how are the saints going to judge the world if God Almighty is going to come and rapture all the church off the earth and turn the earth over to the devil. And of course there we have two kinds of teaching also. Some say, well, they're going to be gone for seven years and then come back. And some say they're going to be gone forever. That the saints have no uh, place on the earth whatsoever. There is no kingdom. Uh, one lady has sent me some literature recently, I think some of you have seen it, in which uh, there's a minister out on the East Coast and she distributes his literature, offers a hundred dollars to the first ten persons who can prove that the scriptures say that Jesus Christ will reign on earth for a thousand years. And they go on to say that there's nothing in the Bible that teaches that Jesus Christ will ever reign on the earth, and then they make this offer of a hundred dollars. It's rather interesting that the offer, you have to prove that Jesus Christ will reign for only a thousand years. Well, you can't prove that because the Greek word translated thousand in Revelation 20 is actually a plural word, so you can't prove it's only a thousand. But in using that offer, they attempt to preach that Jesus Christ will never reign on the earth. Some of you recall the um, Aubrey Moore, who used to have the radio broadcast right before me on KPHO, has challenged any minister to prove out of the Bible that Jesus Christ will ever reign upon the earth. He says that there is no verse in the scripture that proves that Christ will reign on the earth. Now this is this is a Baptist preacher, and I imagine a lot of Baptist preachers believe the same as he does, and yet here are all these scriptures. Do they accept the doctrines of Christ? Well, turn with me over to Revelation 21, because this is the very end of the book, and it's talking about, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, adorned as a bride, adorned for her husband. And then he gives a description of the New Jerusalem, 
You know the rest of it. He talks about the New Jerusalem, and he says that this New Jerusalem is the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, how many of you have attended churches where the church, one of its specific doctrines is that the bride of Christ is the Christians, or the body of Christ is the bride? But here it says in Revelation 21, the angel said in verse 9, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. What is the bride of Christ? The holy Jerusalem. And what is the holy Jerusalem? Well, it has gates and all of these other things. In verse 12 it says, Which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Scripture makes it plain from Genesis to Revelation that Israel, virgin Israel, is the bride of Christ, and yet practically every church denomination in the nation claiming the name of Christ says, Oh no, the church is the bride, and Christ is coming for his bride. That is not the doctrine of my Bible. Now according to what we read in the early part of this sermon, to be a disciple you have to accept the doctrines of your teacher. Now, who is the teacher I'm reading from? But God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read a little more in Revelation 21. We'll read verse 24. Because in talking about this new Jerusalem, he says here the same thing that Jesus Christ said in Matthew 25. Verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. He's talking about new Jerusalem. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. How in the world are the kings of the earth going to bring their glory and honor into New Jerusalem if the New Jerusalem is not upon the earth? And they tell us it has nothing to do with the earth. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Here's something else that's in the New Jerusalem, chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, and in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And what were these leaves for? And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." Yes, brother, sister, the doctrines of the Lord Jesus Christ preach that the, this tree of life will heal the nations of the world. That's the gospel of the kingdom of God upon the earth, and 90% of the people who claim the name of Christian will not have that doctrine. They deny it, they fight it, they preach against us, they call us heretics, and they call us everything else. If we'll read these verses that say that God Almighty is going to heal all the nations of the world. Now before we close, let's turn over to one of the prophets. I have many more verses of scripture here than I can use, but I'll skip around these and use a few. Many of them are quite familiar to you. Turn to Isaiah 11. And I'm going to I think I'll read all 9 of these first verses because this is a this is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ, and I think we should read all of them so that there's no error in the minds of those who listen to me that we're talking about Jesus Christ and what is going to happen through him. And there shall come a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And every Bible scholar who knows anything about the genealogy of Christ, they know that he came out of Jesse. He's called a rod. He's called a branch. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. Remember, Christ said, the meek shall inherit the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. 
and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Why? For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. How in the world can people claim to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, claim the name of Christian, even some of them claim the name of disciple and will not accept the doctrines of the teacher who says, The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Could you ever think of anything that would cover anything more completely than the water covering the sea? Those of you, you've swum in the ocean, you've been on boats in the ocean. Some of you, I'm sure, you've been overseas, traveled, you've gone so far out in the ocean, you're out of sight of the land. And brother, sister, you don't see any land when you're out there, do you? You can look down in that water, you can get powerful lights, you can do everything you want to, and you can't see the bottom because the waters cover it completely. And this is the analogy that the prophet uses and God Almighty uses to show what the knowledge of the Lord will do. It will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. What do you suppose we're going to have on this old earth, this renovated earth, when the knowledge of the Lord covers this earth like the waters hide the bottom of the sea? Do you think we're going to have a kingdom? A kingdom ruled by this branch that shall come out of Jesse, of course we are. That's the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother, sister, if you claim the name of Christian, you're going to have to believe the doctrines of the teacher. And number three, I want to be sure and end with this, number three, according to Webster's Dictionary, it says, and assist in spreading those doctrines. We're going to have to claim the name of disciple and Christian and act upon it and do those things that spread the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout all the world in order to have the knowledge of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I think we'll close in Matthew 28. This is the Great Commission, and I believe that practically every Christian denomination claims the Great Commission. Now, generally speaking, whenever they read this, they're reading it in relation to missionary work to foreign countries. <clears throat> Uh, they don't think so much about it here that uh, the Great Commission means you go to Tucson, but it means you go to Algeria or China or something like that. And they have part of this thing. But here's what Jesus Christ said and what ends up the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, these are the last three verses in Matthew, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And remember, Jesus Christ spent his time preaching out of the old scriptures. He spent years with these men. After the resurrection, he spent 40 days preaching them what? According to the first chapter of Acts, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, those things concerning the kingdom teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And this world is translated from the Greek word which means age. I am with you even unto the end of the age. Now my margin says, there's a note here uh, on verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The word teach all nations in my margin says, Or make disciples or Christians of all nations. Isn't that interesting? That the translation could have read, you go into all the world and make disciples or Christians of all people. What does that mean? That is to teach them so that they all accept what? The doctrines of the teacher. And the doctrine of the teacher says that the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now one more comment before we end this, because I happen to be talking to people that you and I know who we are as far as our ancestry is concerned. Had you ever thought about this? 
we can talk to a group of Anglo-Saxon people, and I happened to see this on television one night. Some of you perhaps did. Billy Graham was preaching out here in Santa Ana or someplace out in California. And for about ten minutes, Billy Graham spoke of the kingdom age when all death and all sorrow and everything and righteousness would reign upon the earth and so on. He, he talked about this for about ten minutes. It's the best kingdom preaching I ever heard him do because usually he stays away from it. And meanwhile, the camera was panning around the audience. And you know, those people were just sitting there. Their eyes were just shining as that man spoke of the day and the age when Christ would rule on the earth and all sorrow and all death would cease and Christ would end all of the ungodly things and would rule and reign in righteousness. You know, there's something inside our race of people that you do not see in other people. You can go out and preach this in Tanya and Ica and tell them that God is going to rule in righteousness upon all the earth and they don't know what you're talking about. They're interested in what's going to happen this afternoon and tomorrow and the next day. The lighter-skinned races like the Chinese, they're interested in what's going to happen next year and maybe a few years from now. But you talk to these Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, Germanic, Scandinavian, and kindred people, and you tell them that Jesus Christ is going to end all unrighteousness in the world and establish a kingdom where the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the water covers the sea, and there's something down in the hearts of these people that desires that. They want it. They would love to see it come to pass. They desire that unrighteousness will end. Now, I'm not talking about just people who claim Christian. I'm talking about the race. There's something in these people that looks forward to that. And I believe that God Almighty has put it in our people. So if the preachers would preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout this nation, there will be a turning to God Almighty such as you have never seen. And brother, sister, there will be more disciples in this land than there has ever been. Millions of people who will believe the doctrines of the teacher and will assist in spreading them. That's how the kingdom is going to come through the power of the word of the kingdom. And we can't go out claiming the name of Christian unless we can first claim the name of disciple and accept the truth of what Jesus Christ taught and assist in spreading it throughout all the earth. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the evidence that thou hast given that it isn't just a case that believing in God, it isn't just a case of saying, well, I know there's a God and then go our separate ways. That, Lord God, you seek disciples, people who can certainly be called Christians, but they, because they accept thy word is truth and desire that it be preached and taught and known throughout all this world. Lord God, we pray for this day. We desire it. Paul said that all creation groaneth for the redemption of the body. Lord God, we seek thy word, thy power, thy wisdom, and thy spirit to help us to stand in these frail mortal bodies as this age rushes to a close. Lord God, shorten the days as Thou hast promised. We claim these things. We ask Your favor in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.